You're listening to The Jam Price Show, all about movies. And today my guest is writer, director, producer, Lisa Hepner. And we're going to be discussing her new documentary entitled The Human Child. Welcome to the show, uh, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me, Jan. I'm really excited to be here. Oh, well, my pleasure to have you here. This, this When your public, publicist reached out to me, about your film, I immediately said, yes, I definitely want to interview you. And I, I wrote to her and I said, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, my wonderful, sweet neighbor uh, in Carmel, I just moved to Santa Barbara. Anyhow, her son was diagnosed last year at age three with type one diabetes. And then another dear friend of mine, son was diagnosed at age 14 months. He is now, 22, I believe, but then his youngest son was just diagnosed about two months ago. He's 19 and he was just diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So he has two sons that have type 1 diabetes. So, you know, when you know people that are going through this, it, it you know, it's a topic that you want to know more about um, for sure. And your film is just really eye opening truly eye-opening. Uh, so our listeners know a little bit about The Human Trial. Why don't you tell a little bit about the film and then we'll get into why this was such a near and dear project for you also. Yes, Jan, thanks for having me again. And I'm, you know, always touched by people who are familiar with type one, especially at such a young age. To be diagnosed at 14 months is, uh, is a big deal. So the human trial is a decade in the making. My husband Guy and I followed a clinical trial in real time that might be the cure for type one diabetes or for that matter, insulin dependent diabetes, which affects 220 million people around the world. The numbers are huge and we don't often understand that. We followed a, a biotech company in San Diego called Viasite. We went behind the scenes with them for seven years following this experimental clinical trial. But at the same time, we also followed the two clinical trial patients, patient one and two, who were literally the guinea pigs in this um, stem cell based trial. So we got both perspectives and we interwove these, these perspectives into the film, the human trial to show, I really for the first time, both sides of the equation and what it takes to get to a cure. And not just for diabetes, but for many diseases. You know, I have to tell you, I, I cried at the end of this, actually. I was, you know, like the two people who were the very first two to go through this um, experimental, ex experiment, I guess you could say this, you know, new technology. Um, it, it, it was heartbreaking in many ways, but in, but in other ways, there was hope. So um, this was a long journey for you. you. You filmed this over seven years, is that correct? That is correct. And it indeed was a very long journey. How did you get access? What, what I mean, I obviously, let, let's tell the audience about your journey and why you decided to do this. I've had type one diabetes for 31 years. And I'm now experiencing the complications of living with this disease. Uh, you can't see my complications. You can't even see my disease because type one diabetes corrodes you from the inside out. And I, I think that's part and parcel as to why it's not really taken that seriously by the general public. I include type two diabetes in this as well because long-term complications of both diseases are the same amputation, kidney failure, blindness, strokes, and heart attacks. It's the other pandemic that we don't know about. So therefore that dovetails into why we're making this film. Uh, my husband and I were living together in Brooklyn in 2008 and we weren't married at that point. And I had a really uh, big hypoglycemic attack in the night. That means my blood sugar fell precipitously low and it's, it's a dangerous place to be. I, I woke up in the morning really discombobulated and confused and sweat soaked sheets. And my, my fiance at that point looked at me and he said, oh my God, Lisa, what just happened? What is diabetes? Because we both make films, he said, we have to make a film about this. 
we then in 2008 decided we needed to make the film, but how are we going to tell the story of this invisible disease to make people take it seriously while also telling a really good story? We didn't just want to create a spinach good for you film. We wanted to create something that the, the general population might pay $14 and eat a, a thing of popcorn and, and watch the film. So we, we really thought deeply about this. And when we moved to LA, we heard about this, um, this biotech company that was doing something radical. And they were programming stem cells to be islet cells, which are the cells I'm missing in my body that don't, I don't produce insulin because I have no, none of these cells. So they programmed stem cells. I heard about them. We went, we started filming the very first day of our filming. They, the biotech company got approval for their clinical trial from the FDA that very day. So I, I feel like the stars looked down on us, Sean, and said, yeah, you got to do this. Amazing. That's amazing. I did not realize that that is really amazing that that day that you went there, you had incredible access. They were very, very generous uh, with you to allow you to um, have such amazing access on this film. Let's talk because there's many journeys here. This is a long um, process that, you know, they were going through, obviously. Um, there is hope on the horizon, obviously, too. This is this was the good news that uh, they've learned a lot from the trials, the human trial uh, that they were going through. Let's talk about that, what, how you and, and the patient one and two for the first two patients in Minnesota. Let's talk about them and how you, how they allowed you into their lives also to um, film them and on this journey. We met patient one, Marin Badger and patient two, Greg Romero, when they were considering entering this very experimental trial. So we met them in Minneapolis in the summer of um, 2018 or 2017, I believe. And they were nervous about the trial and nervous about potentially having cameras following them around. But when I sat down with them and said, hey, I have type one, you have type one, we need to tell this story together. And I want you to trust me that I'm going to get it right. And I'm going to do my best to get it right. And you're going to look at it and you're going to tell me if I got it right. They trusted me with their stories. I think also they realized that me being there, following them during the trial, I was, I was a bit of a sounding board for them. They didn't really have a lot of people to speak to about it because there's a confidentiality clause for clinical trial participants. So because of my position, my extraordinary position, they were able to talk to me because it was a strenuous trial. Yeah, it was a strenuous trial. I couldn't help but wonder if they had allowed, I mean, the, the trial to go on longer. That if they, yeah, I know that and it's hard for me to, you know, you can explain it much better, but the, the vials of the stem cells, is that what they were, you know, inserting into them? Um, I felt that they were taking them out too soon. That was my opinion. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, but I thought, well, if they just left them in a little longer, gave them more opportunity to, you know, to do what they need to do. Did you ever think about that or would, did that ever come up in the conversation? That's an amazing question. And it's a question that one of the patients, Marin, says to Greg very early on, you know, I've just had this implant and I'm getting them taken out next week. And so, yes, both the patients were thinking they wanted more of a shot at it, but the hypothesis of the clinical trial said, these cells are gonna mature in three months. So therefore we need to take them out every two weeks, these cell pouches. And therefore it was part of the protocol that was approved by the FDA to do it this way so that the, uh, the researchers could look at the cells under a microscope and see if they were growing and if they were working. So it was necessary for the science that this happened this way. The researchers learned because of having taken out the cells that they take a lot longer to mature, almost a year. And I would have to fact check that because things are constantly changing in their lab. 
but uh, yes, I 1000% agree with you. I was wondering why they had to take them out as soon as they did, but science dictated that they do that. Um, and has that changed now that they realize they takes about a year? Um, do they have to go back to the FDA each time when they do another clinical trial and get approval from the FDA? Yes, they do have to go back to the FDA every time they do a different version of the trial, a different iteration of the trial. So now they're doing a new clinical trial, which is really, really exciting. They have proven efficacy in the trial that I profiled in the film. So that's great. Right. Yeah, that's great. But they're doing a new one, which they're collaborating with CRISPR, this gene editing company, and that holds a ton of promise to really um, fix that final problem of rejecting the cells. Amazing, amazing. I also, the journey of the, uh, of the actual company, uh, uh, they, what's their name again? Uh, uh, it's Biocyte. Biocyte. Their journey also that you chronicle in this film, you know, how difficult it is to get the funding to do something that's out of the box you know, something different. Um, and I, I was also fascinated by that. You know, you think, okay, they can probably have access to lots of money and they flew all over the world trying to raise the funds. So let's talk about that journey of uh, Biocyte in this film too. You know, as a patient with type one, I've been told since my diagnosis 32 years ago that the cure is five years away. I speak for everyone with diabetes when I say that. So when we went behind the scenes to find out why there was this five-year promise that was never delivered on, I kind of learned why. And it's because in part, it's so expensive to do these clinical trials. On average, it costs $3 billion to take a drug or device to the marketplace. And that's if that even gets through the clinical trial. And running a clinical trial is costly. So this, you know, drawing the curtain back on this research showed me that, you know, these biotech researchers who are the engines of innovation, they have to go around the world raising money when in fact, I think they should be in the lab working on their next iteration and, and fixing the problems that, that they're realizing exist. So the cost of drug development is massive. And I, I certainly had no idea. And I would hazard a guess the general public has no idea. And often biotech is equated with big pharma. You know, that biotech is sitting on this innovation. They have lots of money. Biotech is not big pharma. Biotech is the engine behind these innovative breakthroughs, potential breakthroughs. Big pharma comes in when the risk is less and when the biotech company has proven efficacy most of the time because big pharma is risk averse. So I think that model of financing should change. I do too, but how? How, how do you, and do you have a, I'm, I'm sure after you did all of this, you have thoughts about how it should change. A really great example of how we can accelerate cure research is to look at what we did during the pandemic. COVID-19 obviously brought the world to its knees. To know that the vaccine was put into needles and shots in arms happened within six months of getting it through the last hurdle is, an, is incredible. I know that there was a, you know, a development of that mRNA technology previous to this, but Operation Warp Speed, the clinical trial participants from all over the world, the people who signed up for this, um, the, the companies like Pfizer and Eli Lilly who collaborated together to get this done where profit wasn't the motive. I might sound like a Pollyanna here and maybe I am because I make documentaries, but I think we can really learn from this model. It's not pie in the sky. If we look at what we can learn from the pandemic and the cure and the vaccine that came out of it and apply it to all biotech research. Yeah, great, that, great. Go ahead. That go ahead. would accelerate, uh, sorry, that would accelerate 
these cures and treatments that we all desperately want. It just seems like everything's so slow moving. I mean, constantly. And this, you're right. I've heard the same thing. Five years, five years, there'll be a, you know, a cure for this. And, you know, and then as you say, 30 years later, here you are. Uh, and there, well, there is hope on the horizon. And that's what your film's showing. And that's good news. We, we need good news, right? Uh, always, always. And what I was shocked in doing the research that you six point seven million people died last year, twenty twenty one. Put that number down. Everybody think about that. Six point seven million people in twenty twenty one died from diabetes. That and 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 you said it's the it's the population of Madrid. It's more than we lost to COVID. You know, uh, in the United States, I mean, uh, worldwide is another story, but in the United States, I mean, that number was staggering to me. I had no idea that that many people die from this disease. It, it's absolutely staggering. 6.7 million people. I, I think we become really immune to statistics and for good reason. You know, I could tell you that I could break it down and say one person every four seconds dies from diabetes. Maybe that's more understandable to your listeners. However you want to slice or dice it, it is incredible how many people are suffering and dying from it. And they may not just be dying from the long-term complications. They might be dying in the short term because they have no access to insulin. They might be dying because they took too much insulin at night and their body went into a coma and they died. Yeah, it's it's just I I I I watched this firsthand with my neighbor's son, who you know, a surrogate son to me in a way, um, and you know with there's the, the new technology as as you know, um, and but I know that they everything's on their phone, and I guess that's what you probably have too, and it's always monitored. But it was they're awake all night long because they're worried about what happens as soon as that, you know, little buzzer goes off there, you know, they're up, but I don't think she's slept ever since the diagnosis of her son uh, with this. And um, it's constant, it's never ending. Um, and yet you want your child to have a normal childhood and be able to do the things that, you know, he's got a brother, an older brother and a younger sister, the same things that they can do, you know, and not be treated special and he you know I know he said something to me about that but you know he thought he was weird that's one of the words he used and I said oh no 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 you're not you know so it's it's heartbreaking um to, to watch you know a young child go through any anybody go through it you know you've been through it and you got it you got type 1 diabetes when you were older so yeah it's it's just insidious that's an insidious thing it's insidious. A good friend of mine called it a crying baby that never stops crying. And anyone who looks after someone with type one, like your neighbor, they don't have a good sleep. Their kid with type one never has a good sleep. I haven't slept well for 32 years because my blood sugars, no matter how well controlled they are, they will dip in the night. They'll go high. I wake up. I have a buzzer on me that wakes me up. And it is just exhausting. I think if you were to ask people what this disease is, it's exhausting, it's expensive, and it's scary. Well, that's, yes, it, it is very expensive. Uh, the, the medication's extremely expensive. And that was one of my thoughts when I was watching this movie. When they finally get this, you know, uh, cure, because I, you know, they are searching, this is a cure. How expensive is this going to be for everyone to be able to go through this type of process? I can't speak to the actual numbers because they do constantly change. Um, I know that the biotech company involved, Biosight, wants to make it available to everybody who needs it. They don't want to price gouge. That's, that's not their MO at all. I also know that there's competition on the horizon to Viasite, which is an amazing thing. Uh, it's a Harvard lab called Vertex. 
they're using the same technology, very similar technology device, and they're having spectacular results. Nobody wants to price gouge. And in fact, I think the patient population would rise up in revolt if it became a situation like that. Well, I think, you know, getting everybody else involved too is revolting um, if that was the case also, you know, because that's the problem. I mean, I know they're spending billions of dollars, as you said, to develop this. And then, you know, there's got to be some profit for them down the road, but you're right, you know, hopefully insurance will cover it and won't be price gouged, but I just know how expensive, and you know how expensive it is, uh, this medication is now um, for everyone who, and you're right, some people don't have access to the insulin that can keep them alive. I don't know if you know this, but one in four Americans ration insulin in one of the richest countries in the world. Um, devastating and horrible. You know, there've been, you know, Biden, had, Trump, and then Biden have made inroads on making insulin more affordable across the board, but it's still not enough. Yeah, yeah you're right. It's, it's still not enough. Did you, after you watched everyone go through these trials, uh, think that you might want to go through it also? Become a subject yourself and go through it? The trials for like, for like, make for it like a heartbeat. <laughs> I did. In fact, I talked to one of the researchers and they said, Lisa, you should go in it. And after thinking it through, I thought, no, I need to be behind the camera, not in front of the camera. This was so intense to just even film, to be in two places at once, if that's even possible, following the researchers, following the patients. And uh, there really was no way that I could be on camera in the trial and make this film. Well, that makes sense. But even afterwards now, that you're not, the film is done. Have you thought about going through the trial at this stage? You know, I haven't thought about it, but yes, I think I would. I, I saw what Greg and Marin did for the rest of us. And I think it, you know, the, the needle on cure research will never be moved unless we have participants in clinical trials. So I think if I make this film, it behooves me to put myself on the line as well. So I would do it. Well, the, the film is definitely shining a light on this very, 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 very important topic um, for many, many people. Because, you know, if you just, if you, how many people have it? You know, there's a lot of people who have type one, type two diabetes that you know, everybody knows somebody that has it. So it's, you know, it, it's just that ripple effect and reaching out. I was surprised I didn't, I. The fact that Marin did a um, pancreatic transplant. Let's talk a little bit about that too, because that I, I hadn't even thought that you could do something like that. That was interesting. It's not really available to the general public. There are just not enough pancreases to transplant. So I believe um, that even in Minnesota, or across the US, I believe it was something like one in 30,000 people are even able to have this transplant. Forgive me, let me fact check that. Point is, it's very, very rare. And it's a really invasive surgery and you must go on um, anti-rejection drugs. So really it's for people who have already had transplants like kidney transplants because of diabetes and who have shown that they can uh, weather the drugs, but it's not an option. Really, it's not a viable option. I guess. I mean, I was surprised. And she's going to go back and do it. It didn't take, but she's going to get she's back on the list again from the film. Um, did she get a second one? From the film? She's, still, she's still on the list. And it's because they're just not enough organs donated. Well, let's hope. Let's, there's hope on the horizon. I said a lot of prayers, actually. <laughs> I'm saying prayers that uh, they find the cure, that this, this, this work that they're doing um, is successful, highly successful, and they can get it out there to everyone as quickly as possible to um, help everyone who has this um, terrible disease. Marin, where can, uh, not Marin, uh, Lisa, sorry. Lisa, where can people see the human trial? We're releasing theatrically 
on Friday, June 24th in select theaters around the US. And you can go on our website, thehumantrial.com to see where it might be playing near you. We're also uh, broadcasting it on Facebook Live on June 30th. And this is uh, free to anybody in the world who has an internet connection. We will also be streaming it on your, I'm sure you're familiar with iTunes, Amazon. We'll be releasing that November 15th of this year, a day after World Diabetes Day. Wonderful, wonderful. Everyone, please, uh, please look for the human trial, especially if you know somebody who has diabetes. It's, it's a, a eye-opening film and it, as I said, it does give hope for everyone and it's a beautiful film. So thank you so much, Deepa, for being on the show and um, for doing this. You know, I know it was near and dear to your heart, but uh, you know, thank you for doing it. Thank you so much for having me on your show and best of luck to your, to your neighbor's kid and to everyone in your life who's been touched by diabetes. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you have missed any of the Jam Price shows all about movies, you can go to my website, thejampriceshow.com. All the shows are archived or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast, the iHeart Podcast Network, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. Uh, go When you're at YouTube, uh, go subscribe and, and like us there. Uh, Google Podcasts, the list goes on. We are absolutely on every podcast network I think you can think of. And uh, follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Jail Price Show. Thank you all for listening.